Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and today we're going to be hearing from three different hospitals. The first one this morning will be North Country Hospital, and um, just a public announcement that um, after each hearing, the public will be invited to uh, make any comments they wish to concerning the hearing that just took place, and that um, throughout the time period of the hospital budgets, we have an open public comment portal on our website for anyone who wishes to um, offer public comment. So uh, I see all five board members. The court reporter is here. Uh, we have North Country here. So um, Kim, if you could start us off by swearing in the witnesses from North Country and Brian, if you could just let us know of who will be speaking. Yeah, sure. So we have speaking today, mainly Tracy Paul, um, our CFO, myself as president and CEO. We also have on the um, call with us this morning, Megan Sargent, who's our VP of Patient Care Services and our uh, VP of HR, Paul Giordano. Okay, so if they could turn their cameras on and I'll ask him to swear you all in together. There they are. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> okay. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. So, so with that, Brian, we'll turn it over to you, and uh, we look forward to. Uh, hearing your presentation and uh, learning how things are going in the North Country. Great. Um, well, thank you all for um, starting the day with us. I understand some of you have fog around you today. I can tell you that there is no fog in the North Country right now. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go ahead and show our presentation here. So give me a second to cue that up, please. Okay, are you still with us? You see that? Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, this is just a reminder of uh, the view of our campus from up above. Um, I I do want to encourage you that that summer is still here. This is not a current picture. This is what fall will soon become uh, here at North Country. But uh, um, just a reminder of our campus. Um, again, our presenters today are myself as the president and CEO and Tracy Paul is our chief financial officer. And we do have um, two um, other part, parts of our members of our senior team that uh, may chime in, Megan Sargent and Paul Giordano um, uh, during the Q&A time. Uh, so a quick reminder of our geographic location, as you know, where we have a half bubble service area up here um, because of the Canadian border to our north. Um, and uh, we're 45 minutes closest as the clo closest uh, hospital, which is a critical access hospital, St. John's Vary, um, and two hours to tertiary, which would either be Dartmouth or Burlington at UVM. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so the next two slides show the income statement um, that you're familiar with. Um, I'm going to address any major differences that are showing in this throughout the presentation. So to get into the NPR and the fee increase, so the fee increase on the gross revenues um, for the hospital was 5.6 for the overall fee increase. Um, we put no increase on our medical group um, charges, so it basically nets down to an overall fee increase of 4.9 overall the services. Um, regards to the NPR, um, we show an increase of 7.3% in our NPR. Basically, it's two main factors. Um, one is utilization, and that accounts to about 50% of our NPR increase. And the other is the rate, which accounts for about the other 50%. Um, in regards to the other operating revenue, 
we're showing a decrease of about 15% or $1 million. The majority of that has to do with our 340B revenues. Um, I'll be going on into that in more detail later on when we talk about the risks that we have as a hospital. Um, the balance of the decrease is just small decreases in a lot of different other operating categories. Um, as far as the non-operating revenue, it says it's a 43% increase, but it's only $253,000. That's based on our projected uh, 21 in our non-operating revenues. This is a graphical depiction of our total expenses over the basically the last five years. Um, you will see from budget to budget, it's an increase of about $4.5 million, which is about a 5% increase. Now, what has accounted for that increase? Um, a lot, you know, when you're doing a budget, a lot of the expenses go up and down, um, unfortunately, mostly up. But to summarize, basically, it's four major categories of increase. Compensation um, is about 31% of the increase in the expenses. Benefits are about 27%. That includes inflation rates on um, your life, disability, vision, dental um, from three to five percent. And also we're seeing and have been seeing a large increase in our health insurance claims. We are self-insured um, so that as of year to date, as of June, we are over budget about one point four million dollars. So um, and that's expected to continue. So we have a large increase there. Um, the other area of increase is actually our locums and travelers. We we showed a small decrease in the budget, but um, from March, April until now, um, there's been a lot of changes, which again, we'll go into a little further uh, later in the presentation. Um, the other big piece is the contract purchase service category. Um, that's about 35% of the 4.5 million. And there's two major factors there. We're implementing a new EMR system, um, Cerner, um, set to go live in May of 2022. Part of that conversion process is we have large costs of about $700,000 associated with data conversions, interfaces, and archiving of um, data from our existing um, systems. So that's about 700,000 of that. The other piece of that is that we have increased services from Dartmouth and our pulmonology area and our cardiology area. And then to round that all out, um, the rest of it basically is inflation. This graph shows you uh, basically the comp benefits and locums as part of our total expense. The message basically here is that it stayed relatively flat. Um, we budgeted a little higher, but if you go from 2019 to budget 22, we're basically in the 62-ish percentile. So that stayed rather flat. Um, the next two, the top shows the locum expense. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we did budget, we showed it going down a little bit based on the information we had at that time. Unfortunately, at the time of budget, we had about nine nursing travelers. Now we're up to 15 at the end of July, and we're projecting even higher for the end of the year and going forward, um, which is very unfortunate. And we also have travelers in some other areas, radiology and rehab, that historically we haven't had travelers in that we've been able to recruit for. So we're expecting um, a large increase in our traveler expense over budget. Um, the other graph shows your physicians to total salaries. Um, you can see there's a downward trend there, basically due to loss of um, providers. So tying it all together um, in, in a bigger picture, um, as far as our operating margin, um, you know, when you, here's, here's really what it looks like. So uh, for some, when you look at this, you might look to the left side and see the Big Dipper um, if you're into the stars. And uh, if you look at the whole picture, you might see a duck. There's a duck head on the right. Um, and then the budget is uh, represented in that the green line. The actual is actually the, the blue line. So as we budget, you'll see our budget is fairly flat. But, um, it, you know, as we manage um, even um, day to, our day to day, month to month, um, we're managing against this budget all the time. And just as Tracy illustrated, um, we, we seek to perform at or above budget and there's lots of factors even when we made this budget and projected on it February um, we're already having factors that have changed before our year end um, such as um, she illustrated with the locums so um, the you know overall uh, three years of losses 26 fiscal year 2016 through 2018 um, and then um, FY19 FY20 
and we project FY21 will be um, profitable. Uh, 2019 was an operating margin of 1.7%. And fiscal year 20, if you take out the provider relief, um, and the provider relief is at the top of the duck head, um, um, but if you took that out, it would come back down to um, closer to FY19, which would be uh, roughly 1.9%. Um, so here's another way to look at it. Um, overall, um, you know, our goal is to ensure continued financial and operational sustainability. So year to date through June of 2021, our actual performance is 2.1 million, which it, it really amounts to a 3%. Um, this is attributed to a recent surge in volume. Um, how long it will last is a big question for us um, um, day to day, month to month. Uh, and, uh, and then you'll see our projected um, FY21 was to be 1.8 million, um, uh, which was 2%. So it's really um, a 1% change, but the, between the two, um, on that February projection of 1.8, uh, we it's only 300,000. So um, 300,000 uh, lifts it to, you know, on average to about, or on uh, a roughly one percentage point. Uh, and then our budget for fiscal year, uh, 22 is a budget of 2% or 1.9 million. So close in line to what we're seeing projected um, through June. So essentially um, the summary here is it doesn't take much to move that. Okay, so this is obviously the balance sheet. Um, there's two major categories to note on the balance sheet, uh, the cash and the Medicare accelerated payments, which I'm gonna discuss in the next slide. So you'll see cash flow summaries. The top cash flow shows with the accelerated payments from Medicare that we received in it. Um, and the bottom one shows without the Medicare accelerated. Um, just as you can see from this graph, our normal cash flow balance as of um, in 2019 was about $2.7 million. We're looking at the ending of next year about 10.6 that does still that 10.6 doesn't still include 2.5 million of the medicare accelerated dollars that wouldn't have been paid back yet um why do we have such a high cash balance uh basically we returned to normal very quickly um we were very fortunate up here in the northeast uh, our normal volumes for the majority of our services came back by august september of last year we were actually at budget um, so that helped our financial position. And also um, in the sp last spring, um, as an administration, we made some really difficult decisions about furloughs and salary cuts and such um, that decreased our expenses and, you know, uh, decreased our cash needs. So um, that's why we have such a high cash balance. Uh, as we talked about before, our overall change in uh, charge request is 4.9 percent for this we're requesting for this year. Um, the charge increase effect on payers. So um, on the Medicare payer, basically the charge asking for a charge increase only affects the outpatient side of the service. Inpatient side is a per diem rate, so it does not affect a net a net increase in our charge, or excuse me, a increase in our charges doesn't affect um, our payment on the inpatient, but it does on the outpatient. For Medicaid, a charge increase does not in fact affect our net reimbursement for um, inpatient or outpatient. On commercial, it does affect both the inpatient potentially and definitely the outpatient side of the house. Um, and on self-pay and other, um, it would affect that. Um, that's just a very small piece, less than 1% of our book of business. So that's how the charge increase affects the payers. Now the bad debt and the free care in general, um, we run about 1% of our gross revenue for bad debt and 1% of our gross revenue for free care. And that stayed relatively consistent um, for the last few years. So to highlight a few key service line adjustments um, in budget 22, uh, we have a new general surgeon that we added, um, and um, it was replacing one that um, was uh, we were seeking replacement last year. So we were down one last year. So that physician has joined us in building practice and is built very quickly back up um, to uh, complement the practice. And um, and he has a colorectal training, so um, so he's actually attracted some business um, um, in that profession. Uh, the uh, the and the next one is urology. So we have a ramp up of um, that position um, as we've been supporting that full time. 
that was new in the last year or two. Uh, cardiology ramping up with full time. We previously had had part time and we've been ramping that up with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, so it flipped from an employee employee relationship to a Dartmouth um, contracted service. And we've also even brought in a second provider to meet um, growing demand um, from time to time. Um, we our our service area has said that it could support um, up to two FTEs. We're really at one FTE, so it does make sense that we would need to complement that. Pulmonology, we lost the full-time pulmonologist, a solo pulmonologist. Uh, we are um, looking at um, how we're, we have a trial right now with uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, where it's a combined remote, uh, meaning telehealth and in-person um, encounters. And, um, and uh, we have that position posted as well. Um, and then family medicine, we have some um, turnover there. We currently have Two lo one locum, and we have a second one joining us uh, in, the, um, in the next month to offset two family medicine uh, uh, docs that we um, lost uh, to out of market. Um, and um, so we, we did include the revenue and expense and budget, but it's not locums. We hope to get those. We do have one that has signed that will start in January, um, and we're seeking to get the other one filled as soon as possible. Uh, risk on uh, risks and opportunities our hospital service line we've had no success in in finding permanent placements for these um, the, the filling our schedule and uh, we've been filling them by stretching our primary care physician coverage so not only were they providing coverage in um, our clinics but also doing extra shifts to cover shifts on the hospital um, and with the with the loss of two family medicine, it's created even more um, um, obstacles to try to stretch and fill the schedule. So we've engaged with the national partner to help us to staff the pro the, the hospitalist program, and uh, that partner starts September one. Uh, and um, th the overall cost with this partner is is uh, cost neutral. Um, another one of our risks, as I alluded to earlier in the presentation, is the 340B pharmacy. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the manufacturers started withdrawing from the pharmacy program last year. We started seeing large effects on our dollars um, in about January of 2021. Um, for this year's budget, actual year to date, we're actually below 19% of what we had projected uh, for 340B revenue. Um, at the time of budget, a HRSA letter had come out mandating the drug companies to pay. So we actually did put a little optimism into our budget for the 22 level. But if the drug companies do not pay and comply with the 340B pricing, we're at a potential risk of about $700,000 off our bottom line um, when it comes to the 340B. Uh, competitive lever, uh, labor, this is probably a broken record. I'm sure you're hearing this from all the hospitals so far, um, dealing with staffing shortages in all positions. Um, Tracy again um, shared that we have, um, we started when we were projecting, we were at about nine um, temp or lo locum staff um, through agencies. We're up to about 15 now, um, and we project to be at, um, maybe at, uh, about 22 by the year end. Um, and then um, that doesn't even account the locum physicians um, that we've onboarded to. Uh, there's definitely wage wars going on. Um, and it's not only just in healthcare, but it's multi industry um, for positions such as EVS, dietary. Um, um, we have uh, in the healthcare sector competition um, for RNs, um, e even with long term care, where we've, we've had uh, situations where we've had. Um, you know, a solo position. On, 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 on. We've had we've had um, situations where we've had a solo position offered, a, you know, a, a, another nursing home um, and offered um, quite substantial rates higher than our what our um, working RNs here are making. Um, and then we're dealing with the work life balances. Um, I think we all are. Um, there's tremendous COVID fatigue within uh, our industry. Uh, and um, there's there's going to be challenges, if not already, with compassion uh, for um, dealing with a, um, a third surge, fourth surge, if you will. I've lost count, but um, particularly compassion challenges for 
um, those that are accessing health care that uh, have chosen not to be vaccinated. And so we get a resurge in that. Um, we've also um, seen a resurgence back in our ED to prior COVID volumes just within the um, last two to three months. And so our ED staffing now we've had to ramp back up. Um, we now um, we were staffing pre COVID. We staffed um, three physicians through the course of the day for our 15,000 visits a year. And now uh, and we dropped it down to two um, during COVID. Uh, because of the drop in volume and now we're back to three um, within the last month we've made that decision to to staff that back up uh, and then um, some other things we're doing with staff uh, we've we obtained the services of a clinical psychologist to meet with our leaders and do it in service um, and it was just really to we called it a debrief although debrief is inaccurate as that would assume that COVID's over but it was just to, to connect with them and Brian um, sorry can I just yes. interrupt for a quick second? I, I think the presentation is gone, so I'm not sure. Oh. Kevin, are you also not seeing it, Maureen? Others? No, it's, it's gone. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, something happened, uh, and uh, I'm not seeing it. There was a strange noise before it went out, too. Yeah, I thought maybe that was someone else unmuted. Let me, I'm going to stop presenting because I'll stop and then start present presenting. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thanks for asking. I haven't moved a slide. What, um, so you have to tell me if this is a slide you saw when we hopefully get it back up and running. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can you see it? So the slide that we're seeing is competitive labor. Okay, That's yeah. Right. So this was the previous slide. Oh, hold on, it's frozen. That's not advancing. I, let's see. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna try a couple things here. So now it's disappeared, correct? No, it's still competitive labor, and it's the uh, view of uh, the uh, tire. Now it's okay. Okay, so you're seeing that. So I'm gonna keep it on this mode, if that's okay. That's fine. Um, all right. Okay, so um, so again, under work-life balance challenges, um, I was talking about um, some help that we had with a clinical psychologist, and we're actually going to roll that out with uh, staff as well, offering that opportunity. Um, and really, um, it was very interactive um, and allowed people to um, give feedback and share and um, and see that they're not alone in the world as far as handling the stresses of COVID. We also engaged um, at the beginning of the summer with a physician wellness coaching um, that has group and one-on-one -on -one coaching with our wellness coaching with our physicians and it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so it's a physician. Um, and, um, and so that program was well received. It just concluded a few weeks ago. We're extending it for um, those that weren't able to complete the, the, the six to eight week program. And, um, and then we're also extending um, that one-on-one um, -on -one coaching for up to six sessions a year moving forward um, so um, so that's been well received too so some of the things that we're uh, attempting to assist with that um, our emr is uh, a risk reward i guess uh, we had a couple years ago um, on board with athena um, and then they discontinued the hospital module um, and said they didn't want to be in that book of business. So we had to go through, unfortunately, another exercise of evaluating um, EMR systems. We chose Cerner. Uh, we go live May 2022. Um, this will align us with one medical record, um, increases greatly our optics on metric and quality reporting. Um, with Athena, we've had a, a terrible time with that on the hospital side of things um, and had to customize reports, um, but still not get what we need. Um, you know, we have an investment in training um, into this um, as we kick that off, which kicks off next week um, and we will go all the way in through go live. Uh, and of course, it's the anticipation of the cash flow management with accounts receivable. Um, so those are that's another um, big risk um, and opportunity um, in this next year. Uh, and we're also seeking to uh, invest, reinvest in our aging plant. So our hospital campus, we moved on this campus in the early 70s. Our hosp main hospital building was built in 1973. 
In 2019, uh, we started a, a facility master plan to assess what our areas of greatest opportunity were across all of our infrastructure and our buildings. Um, and that led to a campus development, um, a focused um, high focus on our high priorities, which were inpatient um, and ED. And um, and then our work got stalled because of COVID. So um, we lost about, uh, I'd say, nine months um, on this. And then we picked that back up as COVID was um, starting to normalize. And um, in July of this year, we submitted a certificate of need um, for a new addition of 20,000 square feet and a renovation of 22,000 square feet of space. That will include um, um, all a replacement of all our inpatient rooms, um, so 25 bed inpatient rooms, all private. Um, it will replace our much needed lab. We'll relocate it within um, within the new the new addition, um, and then we will also be renovating existing space. We're going to expand our ED out into uh, our amb our existing ambulance bay and take up that space to add um, more exam rooms, which will be. Um, more uh, will be uh, modernized to um, to handle not only behavioral health but other um, patient needs as well, um, and um, and then we're also relocating our rehab department um, into the old med surge space once it's vacated, um, and then that will free up more medical group space um, if, if needed in the in the the years ahead. So that's a you know there's a whole. Uh, um, more to that should be explained on that, but that's just a, a rough sketch of um, what that plan is. Uh, and and by the way, the cost of that project is roughly twenty two million dollars. Um, again, we need to continue to invest in our infrastructure, which includes equipment. So our budget actually is four point two million this year. Typically, it's about three and a half million. Um, the funding for this year breaks out to 30% uh, 30 spend in medical equipment, 20% in technology, and facilities is 50%, which um, a big portion of that is um, um, a chiller that we need to replace um, that we need to do before um, it, well, it's already passed its life cycle. So um, um, the more that the less we're spending um, on facilities, the more it's costing us in the long term. Um, and then our campus project, oh, uh, going back to that, here's the timeline for that. CON again was submitted in July. Construction, uh, depending on the, um, the status of the CON, could be as early as spring, um, as late as fall uh, in 2022, uh, with completion uh, roughly a year later, or um, uh, a year and a half later. Okay, on to value-based care. So um, as far as North Country Hospitals One Care participation, um, we participate in the Medicaid, Blue Cross, Blue Cross QHP, and MVP programs. Um, one thing to note from looking at our numbers, you'll see that our Medicaid FPP for its perspective payment um, has increased greatly from budget 21 to budget 22. Um, basically, the reason for that is the Medicaid expanded population um, just to show for 2020, when we did the budget for 2021, we had 3,400 Medicaid lives. Um, and then as of July of 21, we have 4,400 Medicaid lives. So basically it's gone up like 20-ish percent um, from then to now, which is um, accounting for that large increase in our FPP payments. Um, we also, like I said, we're part of the QHP Blue Cross and Blue Cross and MVP. Those are relatively small numbers compared to um, the Medicaid dollars. Um, we are anticipating in staying in the same programs for FY22. As far as impacts of COVID, um, some of which we already touched on, but um, um, access to care and wait times. Um, there's been a spike more recently in inpatient uh, utilization for the last couple months. Um, and um, and we are projecting that that's going to um, be that case for a while um, through the um, at least the next month or so um, with news that we received from Secretary Smith regarding um, a resurgence in inpatients for COVID patients. Um, and um, and what's concerning to us is we're already um, been 
um, at capacity for our inpatient. So having that come on top of that is of concern to us, um, and not only for space, but um, particularly because of labor and having enough labor to serve the patients. Um, our lagging ED volume, um, you know, um, really um, in February, uh, when we created our budget, we were expecting that to, we projected that that was content, going to continue, but now it's returned um, um, just in the last couple of months. Um, we're not sure if that's just going to be a summer thing and it's going to go back down. So that's what we're expecting, but um, it, it could end up saying this is back to the, the norm. Um, but virtually all services are now open and um, utilization has been higher than it was pre-COVID. Uh, through the use of te telehealth, really it was a great learning opportunity on um, patient preference. They prefer in-person visit um, now that, that they can come in person. I think that's a great learning for us as we've been evaluating how telehealth will be used and complement uh, the care environment. Um, my opinion is um, that we will be able to use it as an extension for people that um, that uh, use this as their primary source of, um, of their healthcare setting. And when they travel away um, seasonally or for a, a short period of time, they may be able to use the telehealth to reconnect with their provider and um, provide consistent care and treatment um, among the things that you can do, of course, um, through telehealth. Um, and, um, and I see also in future generations, as we see that the future generations um, tend to lean towards telehealth or, t or technology, I should say, um, as those people are growing up in our system, you know, those, those parents were treating their, you know, the peds patients and they grow up and we're using this telehealth now. When, um, when I think of myself as when my kids went away to college and they call and they're not feeling well, um, I'm gonna want them to see through telehealth their provider here rather than going in um, to a clinic in their own setting because it would be a continuation of care. So that's that's why uh, why we call it a great learning opportunity. Okay, another impact from COVID-19 um, in regarding to safety protocols. So um, in the spring of 2020, we made decisions on the access to our buildings um, for the hospital, um, for employees and patients for the purpose of screening. Um, so we used to have multiple point of entries and we basically um, brought that down to only um, a few points of entry um, and we've maintained that so far. Um, the interesting part is we had a security audit, an outside firm come in and look at our security um, as part of our ongoing safety committee. And they basically reaffirmed that, you know, minimal points of entry are the best practice. So um, we'll definitely keep that in place in the future, which resulted from um, COVID. Um, the other thing, testing and vaccinations. Basically, our vaccination rates have slowed down considerably, um, but we have person, you know, if somebody presents and wants a vaccination, we have several ways that they can get that. Um, we'll call a health supervisor, we'll get them vaccinated, basically. Um, just, but when it comes to testing, unfortunately, our testing has spiked um, considerably in the last week or so. It had it had gone down and now it's way back up again. Um, just from the time I submitted these slides, we were doing four days a week, uh, four hours a day for testing. And now we're doing eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, so we're basically doing full full time testing. Um, and the reason some of the reason for that spike is that the Surgical Professional Society has recommended to returning to testing all surgical patients. That's something that decreased um, or that requirement was um, let up for a time and now it's back. Um, as a reminder, we live 10 minutes from the Canadian border um, and the Canadian border has opened back up. Um, but you have to have a test 72 hours from the time you go to Canada and present that test results when you go to try to um, cross the border. And there's a lot of people here who have family and friends and such in Canada that are, you know, wanting to go across the border. Um, there's been a lot of gatherings and visitors from out of the area. Um, you know, obviously the Delta variant has increased concerns. Um, and we do, in, we anticipate even a higher increase in testing once school starts next week. So if I had to sum up um, the impacts of COVID, um, this slide I think uh, covers it. And I, if I had more time, I would probably make this look a little easier to understand. But really, COVID um, required unity, and it brought our not only Newport um, and Vermont, but the whole country together to try to 
uh, address a crisis. Um, there was a single purpose early on, um, a single priority, and um, a single focus on making sure we protect the well-being of the community. And that was really early on in COVID when everything was, you know, um, winding down for that short period of time. But since then, it's really been a return to normal. Um, and um, so a return to normal is still handling the complexities of COVID, but now going to diverse special interest, um, um, div you know, diverse priorities, um, and responsibilities, um, you know, what can we do to cater to the individual, um, and um, tremendous COVID fatigue. So really, um, for our our healthcare organization, there has been no no rest for the healthcare worker or the weary. Um, and uh, you know, I, and reflecting on the last two years, um, I think if it's been it's it's a blur. Maybe it hasn't been two yet, but um, it will be. Um, I think it's actually been more difficult to manage now than when we were um, in the midst of the the, the first um, downturn because of COVID. So um, there's just a lot of competing um, priorities, and and they're all they're all high. So and and really in summary, let's see. In summary, um, you know, as what we're requesting is a charge increase that's a net of 4.9%. Um, again, it's a hospital increase, no increase on the medical group side. Um, that breakout really is 3.3% is for wages and um, employee health insurance, supply inflation, um, really continuing to invest in our workforce and pay uh, market rates. It's a 1.6% increase for just alone for our Cer Cerner conversion cost, um, which amounts to seven to $800,000. Um, and it doesn't, in fact, this budget doesn't factor in the the risks we have with 340B um, and the exposure we have if that continues to have uh, pharmaceuticals um, not honor the payment and uh, drop off the, the program um, and also doesn't include the recent rise in locums. And as I said before, we're trying to manage um, um, a lot of variables here, so um, it, it changes month to month. Um, so approval allows the hospital to to stay on that track of three, per, you know, three years of um, solid financial performance, um, looking to do good things to reinvest not only into the people, but also into the uh, the much needed infrastructure that will also incorporate lessons learned from COVID um, and, uh, you know, a, a, an operating margin, which um, is, you know, at two percent. Um, and as I shared before, it doesn't take much to swing that. Um, and so, um, in summary, just ask for your um, support and then a vote of affirmation to keep, uh, you know, North Country Hospital on that positive track. And that's the conclusion of uh, our presentation, and we'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start our questioning with Board Member Tom Pelham. Tom? Thank you, and thank you both for uh, your uh, your presentation. It was crisp and clear, and uh, I appreciate it. I do have a few questions, and if I get through them in a timely manner, um, I uh, reserve all my time for uh, for Jess Holmes. <laughs> Any remaining time, because she asks great questions. Um, so my my first question is looking at Medicaid, and look, and in uh, 2019. Uh, your uh, NPR FFP revenues were about $12.3 million in Medicaid, and uh, in your 2022 budget, they're at $12.9 million. So it's a fairly uh, flat kind of profile here, but the mix has changed dramatically. Um, in 2019, it was $6.1 million in, in uh, NPR and only $6.1 million in FPP, whereas in 2022, it's $1.6 million in NPR and 10.6 million in F and FPP. And I, I understand that has to do with the Medicaid expansion to a great extent. But I'm just wondering if the fact that that there's a higher proportion of your Medicaid revenues coming through fixed prospective payments, whether or not that encouraged any operational changes, you know, within your hospital to uh, in, in response to that. Think about that for a second. Um, 
I don't think there's any operational changes that um, relate to that, basically, because, um, you know, when our patients come in, obviously we don't, you know, we treat them based on who they are and what their needs are and not what their payers are. Um, sure, with care coordination, um, with the value-based system, um, we could add more care coordination because that's, you know, that, that's a huge help to that type of um, system. But um, I, I don't see us having any other things that we change operationally. Is that answering your question? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I could have gone either way and I'm just, just curious. It's a okay. big shift okay. in your mix and Yep. and whether or not yep. it induced uh, behavioral changes was yes. uh, a curiosity. Um, my next my next question is uh, uh, just a simple one. Do you, you have some fairly powerful legislators on key committees in the legislature, and I'm just wondering how close in contact you keep with them about your, uh, for example, Medicaid revenues. Um, as, as I said, they've basically been flat over the last three years. And uh, do you think that your legislators understand that? So I, yeah, obviously um, it's been more of a challenge this last this last year, and we're starting to be able to get back together. But I have um, fairly um, easy contact and access, and um, with with several of them. Um, and in fact, one I am in Rotary with, so I had the tendency to see during um, when they're out of session. Um, at least you know once a week, um, and uh, and from time to time I get asked questions um, and respond to those. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that we I get in and I say hey here's where we are with Medicaid and here's what our uh, I don't get that far into the weeds. We're um, mm -hmm. trying to seek to respond to what education that they're um, that they're needing with whatever um, bill that they're um, digesting in in the House or the Senate. Yeah. No, I understand that. I'm just wondering in terms of keeping them informed on the cost shift. Um, and uh, so my next question has to do with bad debt. And I noticed that in terms of of the uh, kind of right that bad debt in in 2020 was three point two million dollars. And in your 2021 budget, it was three point one million dollars. And then it dropped in terms of 2021 uh, perspective. Up um, to 1.8 million, which was a 40% drop um, or uh, in in bad debt. Um, and in your 2022 budget, you have it back up to just a little over two million dollars, which is an 11% increase. And I'm just wondering if you have some worry that that number might actually go higher or lower because it's a negative. Um, just looking at the acceleration rate um, coming into the pandemic and uh, thinking that maybe that uh, uh, it, it rises back to its more normal level more rapidly than you budgeted. Um, yep, so in response for that, the increase, actually the increase that you see in the bad debt in 21 or 20 is basically more due to, 20 and 21 is more due to a system issue than it is to anything else. Basically, we went live with Athena in 18. We had a lot of challenges with the bad debt and the recording of the bad debt. So some of the bad debt that you're seeing in those years is actually bad debt from prior year. Um, so that um, that's a reason why that's higher. Um, and you'll see that for the last like four or five years, we, you know, we look at our bad debt as a percentage of our gross revenue. And it's ran about between one 0.07% and 0.95%. So it's it's been pretty consistent in the 1% range. So that's how we projected and, and budgeted for next year is in that 1%. We're not anticipating a large increase in our bad debt for next year. We have a very active navigator team up here that does everything they possibly can to get people either on Medicaid or in a payment plan or free care. Um, so we actually think we can keep our, keep our uh, bad debt at that level. Well, that's helpful. Thank you. Speaking of uh, of, of kind of a um, you know te technical systems, um, I'm wondering how worried you are in terms of the Cerner um, implementation because a lot of times uh, the uh, the early stages of those are pretty pretty rocky, and I'm just wondering, you know, what uh, you know your assessment of of what the startup risks might be um, relative to the to the schedule that you profiled during your presentation. 
Yes. Um, from the financial side, I can speak to um, when we were uh, very concerned. Of course, cash is a very big concern whenever you're going with a new system. Um, but what two things? One, we have a very healthy cash balance, which helps us. But the other thing is we um, we are partnering with a company called R1, who is a uh, preferred partner of Cerner. And what this R1 company does, they're an accounts receivable company, um, and we pay up front. And what they do is they do our Cerner billing from day one so that our patient financial service staff can focus on the uh, prior system and working that AR. And then what they do is they slowly uh, turn over the Cerner billing. We have a whole schedule of how they turn it over as the time goes on. So what that is, what that we're planning for that to do is to mitigate our cash flow concerns because we're going to have the experts from R1 working the Cerner billing. And they're also going to be helping helping us on the front end of the setup of the patient financial and accounts receivable type information. So we're really hoping that, that all of that is going to help mitigate any cash issues. Mm -hmm. And in, in addition to that, of course, there's the whole aspect of how much time and attention everybody needs to put forth now just on the training of the new system. Um, and I would say at least the attitude here at the hospital, um, it's particularly on the hospital side, is um, our slogan is actually the sooner the better, meaning people are eager to get on the new system because it's been so difficult to try to retrieve um, good information from Athena because it just they didn't get there where we needed to on the hospital side. Okay, and just a couple more quick questions. Um, so I noticed in terms of your Medicare Advanced program that in uh, F in uh, after September 30th, 2022, there's still about 5.6 million uh, uh, outstanding on that. And uh, um, I'm just wondering how much of that you think might be at risk of being lost and not being able uh, to, uh, um, you know, be, be relabeled as, as, as revenue in, in uh, 2020, 2022. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, You're the, about the, the Medicare accelerated payments, which yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what, what, which piece we're but talking it's, about. It's the Medicare Advanced Program. And uh, yeah, so you've, the, been, you've been paying that back over the years. And, yes, yes, um, yes, yes. And so in, in 2022, there's still, as I see it, on one of the appendices, 5.6 million of repayments still outstanding, um, with some hope maybe that um, some hospitals are saying that regulations are changing, that they might not have to pay all that back. And I'm just wondering what your sense of that is. Yeah, I honestly don't know. I'm usually, you know, hope for the, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to have to pay that back. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that, that's what your documents say. Yes. Um, and a couple more quick ones. During our rate review hearing, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield in their presentation to us uh, basically said that they need willing partners, more willing partners to participate in their um, uh, value-based programs. And uh, you obviously are participating with them, but I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you're, you know, if you have any insight into, uh, um, in, in, into even in your area, whether or not there's opportunities for expanded uh, engagement with Blue Cross Blue Shield in terms of uh, value uh, and, and their QHP program and in, in their value-based program. I mean, they're looking for willing partners. That was their stand saying that they're willing, they're ready and willing to go farther. They just need willing partners. And so I'm asking the hospitals, how much more are you a willing partner to participate with them? I, you know, we, we basically follow the lead time of, of one care and what they, they set up. So we're, we're all in on everything except for Medicare. Um, and so if, if one care is, is able to um, create you know, you know, it's really an enrollment thing. So if they're able to create a system where the commercial can enroll more on that that program, then you know, we're already in the product. So what we 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 right now we could just say we're on it. Um, and how many more covered lives do you do you have in the program? Um, how can we? You know, we haven't been approached about how we might advocate with them um, for that pr product. Um, we have obviously up here we have a lot of you know Medicare Medicaid. Um, and a shrinking portion of commercial. Um, so um, that's that I think is an obstacle just because of our environment. 
but it's not really a direct answer, I guess. <laughs> um, and my final question is uh, in terms of the border crossing, does the border crossing, whether it's closed or open, have any effect on your workforce opportunities? Yes, so we we actually um, worked really hard with the borders um, um, during the beginning of, of COVID um, and established, we have a, a letter template that we give to those that are um, that live across the border and going home. Um, we've had to accommodate, in some cases, people's schedules where they have to leave. Uh, there's been a time where there was a curfew in Canada, so they had to leave, we had to change their shift so that they could get home and not violate curfew. Um, we've had to re-educate with different you know, personnel on the borders, switching hands um, um, and different leaders. Um, but right now we're, I mean, we're doing well. Um, the people, we've normalized it and we're, if they have um, a, a call to HR if they need anything. We also provide housing if someone has a situ situation where they, for some reason they can't cross the border, you know, we'll put them up in housing here. Um, fortunately, you know, it's going so well, we haven't had to do that. Um, it's really a case by case individual uh, basis that we have physicians and nurses um, and and med techs all crossing the border. So, so it sounds it sounds like if we do ever get back to normal, it'll be a little bit less burden for you folks. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to turn to Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I'm just going to follow up on a couple, start with following up on a couple of the questions that Tom was um, addressing. Um, one, I guess, on, you know, any money that's still out there for PPP, do you have any PPP money and has that been resolved? PPP? Is that... Can you payroll protection plan? Oh, oh, we we don't qualify for that because we have too many employees. Okay. Yeah. And then the COVID money that you still have out there, yes. you know, you talked about being a little bit conservative in in what you're looking at. You may not be able to claim. You know, how much would you say that is? Okay, so I think I think we might be talking about two different things. So what I was speaking to was the Medicare accelerated payment money that we'd have to pay that back. So maybe I misunderstood. Um, we do have a provider relief money still on our balance sheet to claim. Um, that portal opened up in the last few months, and we have to the hospitals have to sub submit all their information by the end of September in order to justify the claiming of that money, so to speak. So basically. Um, we have that on our balance sheet for now until we go through the process of making sure that we can claim that. Okay, and how much that is sense? that? It's yeah. two, it's two point, hold on. I think it's 2.4. 2.4, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then your the rest of it's been forecast. Oh, sorry. 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 I was just gonna say the rest of it has been realized into our financials over the last two years. So sorry to introduce you. Potential for another 2.4. <laughs> Um, and then on top of that, your current forecast, you're actually showing some favorability, correct? Yes, for a projected of 21, yes. So you're going to go up another, what, like six or 600,000 or so? Yeah, and actually as of now, because again, time has passed, our volumes have been so strong that we may actually end our year higher than that. Okay. Um, which leads me really to the next concept, which is when we talk about you know, your EMR, there's about 700,000 of kind of one-time costs that you're putting into rate this year. Is that correct? In the 5.6%, about 700,000 of that correct. is related yeah. to that. And why did you not just take that out of cash on hand? And I say that for a couple reasons. One, because if we build it into rate, then that compounds each year. You we really only need it once. Um, and you are ending the year with significant cash way above where you historically would be. I mean, to the tune of, you know, eight to $10 million, depending on, you know, where you net out. So yeah, I just want to give you 
kind of my point of view right now, I mean, I'm, I'm really looking at that as, as something that should not be in a rate request. Yeah, go ahead. No, okay. go oh, ahead. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I understand that. Um, and, and so I guess what we tried to do is simplify it. Um, and um, through the course of the presentation, did highlight some other factors that are coming in, um, such as our increase in locums, which we haven't factored in, but that's going in. Um, and um, um, so we we have we have other things. We just we simplified it and said, okay, a Cerner that is. You know, I agree. It's um, a, um, a portion of that is one time. We will have some ongoing cost. Um, we acknowledge that we do have the cash the cash funds. Uh, we are already seeking to use that cash for our um, other investments in, in our infrastructure, such as, you know, we increased our um, capital budget um, to four and a half million um, over our three and a half million, or was it, I'm sorry, 4.2 million. Um, so that's $700,000. We've also, um, we also have our uh, building project that we're seeking to finance. Um, and we'll use cash for that as well. So um, we were just pairing all those together and um, and uh, broke this one out uh, within our operating budget. Okay. And then just talking about the surgical increase, um, you know, I think you you put in there about four point two million dollars. Um, and you know, you talked about the surgeon um, kind of getting going on this specialty. But where do you think that's coming from? I mean, where is that volume coming from? Because if you're picking up four point two million, you know, here, um, it should be coming from somewhere. <laughs> You know, other hospitals or, or something. Yeah, and I, I wish we had better data Marine, with our Athena. Um, so um, I guess what what we first notice is that the general surgeon that we have um, that just started, he picked up, um, you know, he, he loaded his practice and got the referrals um, immediately. Um, it was just a period of months to build his practice. Um, usually we've had, you know, the one that had departed um, took a little longer. Um, we do have one, we have three general surgeons. So um, we're actually trying to seek what's the balance between the three because um, um, one is not as, um, um, is, is not, um, it, there could be a balance of business that's going internally. Um, and um, and so we're, we're seeking to understand that. Um, we, we, we have a hard time tracking if um, how many of our docs were sending out colorectal um, outside our community. Right. Um, again, um, with CERN, I think we would have had a bit easier time to, to evaluate that. So it's, I, it's more of a feeling right now um, and uh, just seeing how quickly he ramped up. Okay. Um, and then uh, can you talk about two or three cost saving initiatives that you have going on right now and you know what type of impact we can expect for those um, short term and long term. Yeah, yes, I can. I just have to find my magic sheet. <laughs> so, OK, so some on the supply chain side of things, of course, are part of the NIA. Um, buying alliance, but we've been doing that for a while. Um, some of the things we've done, we've evaluated and reduced our swim, swim quest, sim quest copier fleet. Um, as you can know, there's a lot of copiers throughout our whole, our whole campus. Um, so we brought that down about $21,000 a year. So for the next four years, that'll be about $85,000 worth of savings. Um, we're converting a lot of brand name commodity supplies to the Medline brand. Um, estimating saving about $20,000 in rebates. Um, we're convert, converting our hand sanitizer through a different brand. Um, we negotiated with Stryker, which is really good with the trauma implant, saving about $170,000 a year for that. Um, and we're working with our uh, GPO from Vizient to maximize contract compliance. Um, that looks like we might get about $90,000 more worth of rewards in a year. So that's some of the things that are kind of specific to the supply chain we're working on. Um, you know, but on top of that, obviously, like probably all the hospitals have told you, we've been, you know, concentrating on getting the supplies we need, right, for our patient care. And so we can't always, you know, 
um, the cost savings don't always come with those because we have to pay the prices that are being offered at the moment. But on the side, we're also trying to do some other stuff with the things that we can. Okay. Um, and then just one last question on the, the ER. You know, we've seen the trend is down, you know, across many of the hospitals and not really coming back in all cases. And, and do you see, is there, you know, any either behavioral change, people going more to urgent care or, you know, their primary care or telemedicine? I mean, you know, ho hopefully out of COVID, we're going to get some some benefits and, and, you know, maybe people are changing or, or what are you seeing there? What do you think is going to, how is it going to return? Go ahead. So um, I think um, initially people were just, everything shut down and so they they were nervous <laughs> um, and we actually looked at our level of visits and our level of visits for that were coming in the ed were true emergent higher acuity and the bottom dropped out of those i'll call it convenient ed vis visits um and um and and just because this lit up within the last um, um couple weeks or sorry, a couple months. Uh, we don't have enough data to evaluate how much of that balance is from the lower acuity, but we we do have truly sick people coming in um, and that higher volume and a lot of emissions through it. So I think, unfortunately, the delayed encounters has led to more higher acuity encounters. Um, and then and then you couple that here with us, we have you know more people visiting the area than than before, and so we have some of that. Um, I mean, we had. We had a, an individual from out of state, I won't name the state, but um, we had an individual from out of state that came in um, and was COVID positive and met um, admission criteria. Um, so, and they were multiple states away and a whole nother time zone away. So we're seeing more of those types of things right now. Yeah, it's very hard for us to predict because for I've been at the hospital for 25 years and in the summer we always have a large uptick in our ER visits just because of the amount of population that comes up here um, and everybody's active and doing things and getting hurt. Um, so we've seen that uptick just barely July is the first month that our ER revenues have actually come back to volume. So it's hard to tell what that you know what that's from if it's from the visitors or if it's from from people being more comfortable to come back into the ED or um, seeking that other type of lower level um, um, care or whatever. Again, like Brian said, we haven't done that analysis yet, but we're we're kind of waiting to see because we really don't know if that's you know why that why our uptick has happened again because it had been down way down since March of 2021. We are Marine. We are in discussion with um, Northern Counties about. Um, doing a partnership for a walk-in clinic. We don't have, we've tried in our community walk-in clinics, um, opening extra hours and it just hasn't worked. It's tr been tried three or four times. And um, and for some reason, people just, they'll just go to the ED. So uh, we just finished our community health needs assessment. Um, and that's one of the questions we um, asked our, um, our uh, community groups. Um, about walk-ins and um, walk-in availability. And I think it's gonna end up being one where people like to know that it's, that it's available, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna access it. So it ends up being a, how much cost do we invest in that side? Um, and um, I don't think I don't think it will pay for itself, but it, it, from a value-based side of things, it's it, uh, is likely the right thing to do. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, that's something that we looked at to continue to put some activity and thought into in the you know years ahead or a year ahead. Okay, great. No, and uh, you know, as one of the smaller hospitals, it's it's good to see the you know strength of your balance sheet has improved. I mean, we don't like the reason why, but but it yeah. is you know, one of the reasons. But it you know it is good to see that that's you know worked there. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we'll go to Jessica Holmes. Jessica. Great. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I do have a few questions. Uh, building a little bit on some of Maureen's questions um, around the projections. I'm just looking at the the memo that you all sent um, in July 21st mm -hmm. about the question around the projection. Is it still valid? Um, and the estimate there was taking the actual performance through June and then assuming that North Country meets budget for July through September you are projecting a net operating margin now of 2.4 million. 
So that assumption was if July, August, September were meeting budget, but my guess is, as what you've described, you're exceeding budget still through the next, yep. you know. So this, do you have a new <laughs> updated, updated? I mean, what are you projecting if, okay, great. Could you just share that with us? And sure. what your actual projected NPR now will be for year end? Those two numbers are really helpful. Okay, I have the first number at my fingertips. I don't necessarily have the second number at my fingertips, but I would be glad to get it for you after. Um, so we just finished our July financials. So we're actually at $2.5 million um, at the end of July. So we're already past the 2.4. We had a very strong revenue a month. Um, that, and I'm predicting we'll probably end the year at 3 million or so. Now, the only thing that I'm not sure about there is two things. One, if the revenue continues as strong as it is in July. And the other thing is we talked about the traveler's expense and a lot of that traveler expense is just coming on board. So July was like a month that we had a higher traveler expense, but I'm anticipating that our travelers are going to get much higher on the expense side for August and September because of all the things we talked about before. So that's why I'm saying about Three million or so. Okay. Um, but and again, that's your slide. Okay. So it, it, yeah. Great. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then, so, and in terms of margin, that would be 3% instead of the two yes. that you originally had right. projected. Okay. And yes. then the total margin originally was going to be 16.7. So, what is that looking like now for you? I don't have okay. that calculation. Okay. That's but fine. I can get it to you for yes. sure. I believe that you can. That would be fantastic. So, the total margin okay. would be really helpful. And then the also, um, if you know the projected NPR okay. at year end would be helpful because it's helpful for us to see what is projected NPR and then what is the new budgeted 2022 you know NPR what is that growth rate so that would be really absolutely. helpful okay yeah, absolutely no problem um, and let me just ask you so I, I'm a little bit confused about the 340B and I know there's so much uncertainty around this um, you know, with respect to the manufacturers failing to adhere to the guidelines and then HRSA sending a note. And I know mm -hmm. I recognize that you're all under uncertainty as to whether or not the manufacturers are going to actually comply with what HRSA is asking them to do. Um, Brian, I thought I heard you say you didn't take into account the risk around 340B, but I thought I read in the narrative that there is a million dollars less in the 2022 budget than in the 2021 actuals. So yeah. can you just confirm for me what the assumptions are around 340B? If it's, it, you know, it sounds like that's actually incorporating some of the risk if you're actually dropping, um, you know, from 2021 actuals, there's a million dollars less in 2022. And also particularly, I'd like you to address that a little bit with respect to now that your volumes are increasing. Will some of that 340B revenue come back simply because of volumes apart from what the drug manufacturers do? So could you address okay, that? I, yeah, I would be I would love to address that. So like um, I think what, what we're looking at is that so in 2020 was our highest 340B revenue year, right? We had five point million dollars. And then in January 21, it stopped started dropping. So for projected um, as of the end of June, we were projecting, we're projecting out, now this is from our financials as of the end of June, so it's a little different than what we submitted, but we're projecting that we're going to end up at like 3.6 million, okay? So we're a million eight off from 2020. Um, okay. We put in, we put in our projected for 21, three point, almost 3.7 million, which is about what we were running at that, at that time. So, for budget 22, we said, okay, well, we got the letter. We're not going to go down as low as what we're running during this year. We're going to have a little optimism in there. So we're going to increase it from the 3.8 to the 4.5. So that's where we, you know, we put the um, revenue budget, the 340B revenue budget up. But we're, like you said, we are still a million dollars down from what our actual 2020 is, even with our budget 22 numbers. Okay, so it's actual 20. 20 not 2021 yes. i thought it was yes. for some reason i think i must have misread them that it was or okay. yeah i could have put the wrong number but that's and we it. also i could have misread yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah and jessica in our um, compliance meeting just within the last month and we had a 340b report out that's where we're also learning that yeah although um the pharmaceutical companies are being told to pay that out they're still refusing to and some are just that 
that what's not built into the budget is um, them just dropping off. So we had a new of, one. Yeah, we had a new one drop off. So that's not even in there. So that's kind of that that yeah. was part of my color commentary. Yeah, got it. Got it. I mean, given what's happening with 340B and year after year, we hear the risk of 340B. We also know how it, you know, contributes to the bottom line of many of our small hospitals. Yeah. How are you thinking about going forward with less reliance on 340B to, to make, you know, the bottom line work as as clearly there's even more volatility and less, um, you know, reliance? So I- yeah, so conceptually, I think of it as a, you know, going down a rabbit hole, because <laughs> um, the 340B is, you know, you take that piece out, and then, you know, the bottom line is decimated, right? Um, but so we focus on that. But there's always one thing that's kind of, you know, whether it's a, a regulatory thing, whether it's a critical access hospital, where it's value based, where it's, you know, one care. There's, um, you know, the local. It's always it, there's so many things to pursue and in this is in this case it's a matter of there's only so much we can control in that it's a national discussion what ca- what helps me sleep at night um, on this topic is that i have to believe for the sake of our country if 340b was erased and it decimated hospitals rural hospitals across the country there'd have to be something to be that would rise up to take its place a different way um and it, it's actually the same this the same really thought i had during covid when we were you know losing several million dollars in that first that first you know month two months and the hospitals across the country have the same thing i have to believe in the 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 goodwill and the um of of our country to say look we can't afford for the healthcare system to to fall and not serve people there's there's too much interest in um, you know our our American our American society wants access to care and they want it immediate that and um, and so I I just have to think of the goodwill of, and the good nature there's got to be something that rises up because common sense says it can't you can't lose half your hospitals in the country all of a sudden mm-hmm. right so I would not <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, so I wanted to thank you actually for filling in the HCA's table on the commercial to Medicare reimbursement ratios. That's, uh, I'll speak just for myself, but it was very much appreciated that you really tried to do both parts of the yeah. of the table and um, not all hospitals did both or even half. <laughs> um, so it was really helpful. And your inpatient, you know, if we look at that, you know, your inpatient reimbursement is pretty close to Medicare, 120% of Medicare. But your outpatient, right, is 260% of Medicare. So there's a big difference in inpatient to outpatient in terms of the relative reimbursement ratios. Um, And and the 260 is on the higher side of what we typically, I think, see. And I'm wondering how you are thinking about the, um, you know, the rate request that you're asking for, how it's going to funnel down to those measures. If we come back this time next year, what does the inpatient look like and what does the outpatient look like in terms of the relative Medicare reimbursement rates? If that, if you're, how are you applying your rate request to those two, you know, component parts? And then what would that look like this coming back next year? <laughs> and maybe oh. that's too much math to apply, but I'm, you know, are you evenly, are you, you know, is outpatient, are you going to be, you know, uh, charging, you know, the 4.9% also to the, to all your outpatient, or is it going to be disproportionately more on the inpatient side? So you're going to bring up that, you know, commercial to Medicare ratio on the inpatient, but try and keep that outpatient commercial reimbursement ratio closer to the, you know, where it's at right now, which is already on the high side. That's my question. Okay. That, that's very helpful. Thank you. So when we apply a rate increase, we apply it across in and out. Right. Besides, with the exception of what I had said earlier in the presentation, is we did not apply any rate increase to our medical group, to our physician practices. But on the hospital side, the amount will be applied equally through all our charges, whether they're in or out. So that relationship will basically stay the same, um, if that answers that question. Um, and basically, you know, the and I again, I hope I'm answering your question. The Medicaid on the inpatient side, obviously, all those payers pay basically the same way. They pay a lot of times on a per diem rate. So I think that's why you see that that relationship is so close because they pay basically the same way and just a little different per per diem rate. And of course, on the outpatient side, 
Um, yeah, again, the commercial is percent of charges, right? So we know there's the cost shift there and they are the ones that are going to bear the burden of the percent of charges and the cost shift versus Medicare does bear some of that burden because they do pay percent of charge on a critical access hospital, but Medicaid doesn't, they pay fee schedule. So there's no, there's no, um, the rate increase doesn't affect them. Um, so, you know, those, they're going to yeah. change accordingly, I guess, in the right. same way, but accordingly. And does that you, answer your question, Jessica? It does. I mean, okay. it does acknowledge that the cost shift exists, um, which it we does. certainly, you know, part of our statutory mandate is to consider the extent to which the costs incurred by the hospital in connection with services to Medicaid beneficiaries are actually being charged to non-Medicaid beneficiaries, effectively yes. quantifying the cost shift. And so to the degree that you're, you know, you can see it in your commercial rate request, um, sure. you know, in some ways I'm surprised it, it doesn't break down in your uh, commercial rate ask. You broke it down into inflation and the Cerner component, but clearly there's also got to be the cost shift is in there, embedded yes. in there through the yes, it is. costs, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and so that's another question uh, around the the 4.9 percent. You broke it down, you know, as my colleague Maureen already alluded to. Part of it was uh, the Cerner component, and I had a similar question about why not use just days cash on hand to cover that. Okay. Um, but I know you already answered that question. The 3.3 percent that you're referring to in terms of inflation. Um, when I look at the inflation worksheet that you all provided in the appendix. I don't see 3.3. So I, you know, there's very little that actually rises above 3%. Most of your, it's 2% for medical staff. It's 3% for non-medical staff. Um, there were a couple of areas where it was 5%, but the, the component of your overall expense budget was 1%. So it can't be driving too much of that overall inflationary trend. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to the 3.3 in relationship to the inflation worksheet that you all submitted, which to me looks more like a 2% inflationary factor. Okay, so I guess I'm losing where the 3.3% came from, Jessica, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay, it's on your slide. Uh, it's on slide, hmm. i have to pull it up now. It's on the slide where you break down the 4.9 into 3.3 for wages, insurance, inflation, and then oh. the 1.6 for Cerner. So I'm just trying to understand in, yes, you know, so that's yes. all inflation basically wages, employment, health insurance, which was broken down in that appendix, but yep. it doesn't it doesn't get me to 3.3. It gets me to something in the area of two under three. OK, so Jessica, I think I'm going to have to take that offline and look at that a little closer okay. so that I can get you a real accurate answer, because just on the fly right now, I, I want to put all the pieces together so I can get you a good answer on that. Hugely helpful, and I totally understand. Okay. I, I don't like doing math on the fly either. So <laughs> totally, totally. My adding machines in my office. I get, yeah. you know, so. No worries. I, I appreciate would be glad it. to do that. Yeah, I'd appreciate just that. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and I guess my last question really just revolves a little bit around some of the work that you, or some of the conversation that you just had with Maureen around the ED and analyses that you all are thinking about doing, um, or particularly thinking about you know, the acute patients that really need to be there, and then the patients that are coming in, that you, I think Brian, you referred to them as convenient encounters, which I know every hospital sees, uh, convenient encounters, and then the possibility of some of these walk-in clinics. And I, the reason I wanna bring this up or expand upon this a little bit is, as we are moving to value-based payment, right? You know, Cost and quality are gonna matter, and we did have a presentation last week from Mathematica that looked at hospital by hospital analyses of potentially avoidable utilizations. And North Country is actually at the highest um, as a proportion of um, Medicare fee-for-service revenue, 37% according to Mathematica's estimates, this is from 2019, only looking at the Medicare population, but 37% of North Country's inpatient and ED Medicare fee-for-service volume was characterized as potentially avoidable. This doesn't mean that people that come in don't need the care, but had they had care in a different setting at a different time, they may not have needed to come in. So I think some of the work that you already said that you're thinking about in terms of walk-in clinics and some of the population health reforms, my hope, and I guess I'd love to hear you speak to that, is, is hopefully gonna bring that down given that you're at the higher end of, at the highest end of the state um, in terms of the types of encounters that are happening, not only in the ED actually, but also in the inpatient setting, patients who had, you know, 
their diabetes been controlled at an earlier stage wouldn't have ended up in you know an inpatient and other things like that. So just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and the plan going forward as we think about value-based care. Yeah, so I, I won't repeat on the, um, the walk-in clinic um, or the convenient care clinic. Um, I, I will share um, just briefly that, uh, and I'm gonna actually have Megan Sargent jump on here in a second to talk about something. I'll cue that up, but um, um, we have had already discussions even you know before COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, I did talk to you know one care about what's the opportunity for investing in. Uh, there's no doubt that if we if we put the money in um, into a walk-in clinic, it's 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 got to be seen as an investment. Um, and 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 you know when you looked at our um, our rate increase and it's on the hospital side, we, we and we're not doing anything on the medical group side. We're investing in our medical group by um, by offsetting it with what we do on the hospital side. Um, I choose to use the word investment. Um, and so um, so you know approaching um, on some sort of how, you know how do you get how do you motivate um, an organization that is. Um, helping balance the bottom line on utilization and then say, well, take that book of business away and then invest in something that's going to cost you money on the walk-in clinic and it either works or doesn't. So um, even if it works, you lost the higher volume or the higher utilization dollars. And um, and that's, you know, that's the struggle with value-based, right? Sure. Um, so, so we we have had the conversation, um, um, even with our medical staff, to digest what has worked, what hasn't worked, what's the you know um, 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 pushback, if any. Um, we have I have had multiple conversations with Northern Counties to continue to look at the model and how it's working at St. Johnsbury. So I was cl- pleased to see that they started one, so we can look at that and evaluate the cost star. Uh, and again, um, did. Um, I'm already repeating myself, but talked about it in the Chenna. I do want Megan Sargent, our VP of Patient Care Services, to talk a little about about what we're doing on the case management side of things, because I think that will help with the utilization discussion. Go ahead, Megan. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, um, like Brian said, um, regarding those, um, I don't know if I'm going to call them um, avoidable visits, um, especially in the ED. Um, case management is where we are spending our time and energy. We have a dedicated case manager um, for our ED patients who works closely with our outpatient case management department and primary care. Um, we meet on a regular basis with the inpatient and outpatient team to um, discuss those um, high-level patients. We monitor also our um, frequent ED visits. And again, our ED case manager is intimately involved with a warm handoff to primary care for those patients and helping identify any barriers to access um, outside of the ED, whether that is um, they they aren't established with primary care, um, it could be transportation in this area, that's a huge one, or just general knowledge of what's available to them as far as care. Um, Regarding the patients on the inpatient side um, that could have been avoided, avoided, again, it you know, we're, they put all my eggs in one basket, but it's care management. It's that care coordination um, and getting them involved on the outside um, in primary care, establishing those relationships and um, really that preventative care um, and and helping people to um, access needs prior to um, being admitted. Um, Our care management, our outpatient care management team um, will come in and do warm handoff as people are discharged discharged um, so that we have that um, care continuum through across our organization. Um, additionally, the outpatient care management team is coming to the um, discharge planning meeting, um, inter- interdisciplinary discharge planning meeting on a daily basis to help facilitate that. Um, so those are some areas, you know, that, you know, we're, we're working on and really, again, investing in our care management team and seeing that as a way to, um, you know, improve our are standing with value-based care. And Maureen, just to, I'm sorry, Jessica, just to share one more um, story to highlight, you know, um, the obstacles is, you know, we, we had a pay, another, you know, another patient come and was, um, we, we believe it's COVID positive um, and wanted to do the test. Um, they met admission criteria and um, refused the test. After several hours of the staff working with this individual to try to 
um, advocate for getting the test so we could responsibly handle and um, the course of treatment, the patient said no and checked out AMA. So when that patient comes back, you know, yeah. that's a, you know, so, so we're dealing with the, you know, all of us know this, we're dealing with the, you know, free will and free choice and the hospitals are that last, um, that last point of accountability. Um, but we can't, you know, we can't control free will and free choice. We can only educate and seek to influence it. Thank okay, you. Well, I appreciate, yeah, thank you. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing in these regards. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Robin, Robin Lunge. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple questions. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on um, Tom and Jessica's questions around the Medicaid FPP shift in the care management um, conversation that you were just having. It seems like um, the increase in your attributed lives when Medicaid went to the geographic attribution or whatever they're, I, I think they changed the name of it, but whatever they're calling it now, um, obviously that happened right before COVID and COVID was all consuming, but I'm, I'm wondering if you see that as an opportunity um, to maybe increase your outreach to some of those patients who maybe were not seeing primary care and thus weren't attributed. And so how you see that piece of it in relationship to your care management efforts. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, with, with Megan Sargent's lead on this, we're, we're seeking to build on, um, the case management side of how we identify and reach out to these people. Um, and um, how they're identified to us. So I, I I can't speak, you know, specifically about what that plan and approach is, but there, you know, we're we definitely wanted to take that approach. I mean, you haven't. I mean, that shift in Medicaid happened right before COVID, so you haven't really had an opportunity. But I hope. I guess I'll just say I really hope that you're you're thinking creatively there because I think part of the point of the, of the FPP sort of financial structure is to allow for that creativity and um, and and thinking about how you can do care differently in primary care to avoid uh, those later hospitalizations. Um, yeah, so thank Robin, you about thank that. You. Yeah, Robin, we are using, te you know, telehealth created an advantage too. So whether they were established or not, um, we were able to connect with people and even um, on the no-shows particularly around behavioral health. Um, some were more comfortable on that setting than they were in person. Um, and then some that missed their appointment, we were able to call and still have the session. Um, so that's a illustration of that creativity that we seek to continue. That's great. And, and I did notice in your, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Robin. I just wanted to also highlight that our care management team, inpatient and outpatient, I mean, we were payer agnostic. We're, we're really, um, striving to um, meet people who have the need. Um, if they're if they're screening in um, for you know case management services, then then we're doing that regardless of um, you know what the payer may be. Great. Who was that that just spoke? Megan. Oh, sorry, Sargent. I was. Yeah. Yeah, Megan Sargent's our VP of Patient Care Services. Okay, it was coming through on a phone number instead of uh, through hers mm -hmm. on, my, on my computer. So, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make uh, sure that it was someone who had been sworn in. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> she no swore. Worries. <laughs> no worries. Um, I, I did notice also in your um, narrative that you talked about a telehealth grant that to help boost cell signal and um, with remote patient monitoring. Could you talk a little bit about how that's going to be integrated into the care management efforts? um into the care management so it's a lot of infrastructure yeah. support so um so for example boosting satellite and home signals that alone connection allows for the telehealth yeah uh, it's also boosting signal signal strength here on the campus it's also it's there's a lot of hardware um, and that grant also benefits not only our hospital but um it it benefits uh, the local nursing homes for, for boosting their their telehealth connections. It also um, um, we have resources built in there for specifics that um, that the VNA needs in our area, um, and um, also uh, NKHS. 
so it, it's a broad reach um, and uh, but I would say most of it is infrastructure. Well, and I think, Brian, also that infrastructure um, allows us to do um, more home monitoring for our care management team, um, in increasing um, people's access to Internet service and high speed allows us to have those home um, setups where we can monitor if you're a heart failure patient, we can monitor your weight, we can monitor your pulse ox, it can be sent in and one nurse can monitor that central station um, and then reach out based on based on what you're reporting vital signs are and how you're reporting your symptoms that day. So expanding that internet access um, has huge, huge implications on how we can manage um, patient panels more effectively. Great, that's terrific. Um, I So my other question had to do, hold on, let me just get to where I wrote it on one of the slides, I think, um, had to do with um, the discussion that you had around um, the, so on slide 11, uh, your compensation benefits and locums, it sounds like there's a bunch of different factors that are going yeah, into like those costs. Um, you've mentioned the, the increase of traveler needs and locums in a couple different areas. Um, but you also mentioned that you had some furlough and salary cuts. Could you just unpack that for me a little bit more? I just want to have a better understanding of kind of what are the ups and downs um, related to your staffing. Okay, so I mean, I can start and then Brian can um, join or whatever. So the, the, the salary cuts and the furloughs happen during the time period of basically Aprilish May of 21 till July August of 21. So those show um, in our numbers there. Um, we furloughed when our revenues went down. We furloughed the staff accordingly. So we did do a large furlough effort during that time. And also, um, senior leadership, leadership, and physicians took uh, pay cuts during that time frame um, in order to um, help that situation. They were returned to us at the end of the year because our our, value, our volumes came back. But during that time period. And we did that. And the furlough is the biggest impact, obviously, on the on the salary piece side. Um, and again, that happened in that time frame of the year. Um, and as far as the locum and the benefit piece, uh, health insurance had been running pretty steady. And we'd seen in this last year into next year that the health insurance has gone really high. So that's in those numbers. And yep. then, of course, in the locums, um, we put them basically flat, but again, that's something if I redid this graph today and um, looked at it, it would probably be a lot higher and unfortunately probably will be higher into next year. So there's very, there's a lot of different factors that are going in here with big dollars. So I think that's why you're, you know, and if you add them all yeah. together, they basically come out that way. <laughs> and we're self-insured okay. too. Yeah. We're self-insured yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I... So thank you. That's helpful. So the salary shifts and the furloughs were time limited related to COVID. They weren't. I, I, what I was trying to sort out was, did that have an impact on um, any sort of staffing vacancies and that which then you have to fill with locums and how that all fit together, if at all? Yeah, no, we brought back basically all our staff that um, from the furlough effort unless there was some other reason why they didn't want to return. Um, so yes, we brought them back. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, I just have a few questions. Uh, I'll start with the sooner the better. Um, <laughs> in the past, uh, you had told us that uh, the reasons why you were with Athena were pretty much about price. And um, I'm curious if it's the same um, you know, your primary uh, referring academic uh, centers, uh, UVM and Dartmouth, uh, are both with EPIC. Um, what what was the, was it again a, a price consideration, or do you feel that you're going to get some efficiencies out of CERNA that you would not have gotten out of, say, an EPIC? So we definitely would get better um, efficiencies with CERNA than from, um, I think, from EPIC just because of EPIC is epic. <laughs> it's uh, it's larger. Um, I consider it the Cadillac of systems. It costs far greater. 
So it, it wasn't that hard of a decision between the two. I'm sure Epic could have worked for us, but it's it's not wired for a hospitals our size. So we felt it was just overall Cerner was a better fit for cost and quality for what we needed. Um, do you want to add on to that? Or? Yeah, we also looked at Meditech um, was the oh, other sure. player and Meditech is more appropriate for a hospital our size. Um, and clinically, they came about the same, but the cost, there was a very dif big difference, differential, and Meditech was much more expensive than Cerner was going to be for us. And Cerner did a, have a slight advantage as far as um, the clinicians and such um, preference for that for Cerner. Will they embed staff with you during the transition? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, you know, you look at the millions of dollars that flowed in, you mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation that um, you felt you were the beneficiaries of uh, a population that you're serving that had confidence in, in your safety. And so that uh, utilization came back to normal quicker than, than other hospitals experienced. And, you know, you're going to finish this year with probably a likely projected 17% uh, um, total margin. And yet you didn't uh, choose to expand into um, the Medicare portion of the all payer um, model. I'm just curious if not now, um, will that ever be considered and you know what your considerations were? So, um, so um, first off, um, Chair Mullen, we, Again, when we started the budget, February didn't look like what it does on a February projection, didn't look like the trajectory it does today. Yeah. So that's how quickly things can change in a matter of months. And it can also go back the other way. So we consider that. Um, the only hospitals, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the only critical access hospitals that are in Medicare are part of systems. So that would be, um, you know, they're part of Dartmouth or they're part of UVM. So there is a little, um, in my opinion, there's a little um, uh, a backup plan. Um, I'm still not convinced that uh, um, that the risk outweighs the reward um, when it comes to Medicare understanding its impact on critical access hospitals and the critical access hospital um, um, method for reimbursement. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we don't get kicked off a program that um, that we can't get back on um, because of you know there's so few that are there's no nobody else there's nobody to model this off of except for those two that are already part of systems. Um, I think the the risk um, and how much we have to book for reserves is great, um, and I think it's 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 only going to be it's going to be a matter of time and and seeing closed out cost reports that are definitive. Well, we have our consultants that tell us, yeah, we think this will work, or yes, we think this 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 could be a benefit. Um, and um, but we don't have any hard evidence. And cost reports take several years to. Um, I mean, our out latest outstanding cost report is 2019. Yeah. So I until we have some settled cost reports, I I think our hospital would be in jeopardy if it jumped to that. Um, I did work with one hospital. Um, years ago that ch chose not to become a critical access hospital and they're in dire straits. So I don't want us to be in that situation um, and put that risk. It's it's just too great. Okay, you mentioned that uh, um, as far as the pharma and the 340B, there was a new um, player who dropped uh, off. Who, who's Who was that? Oh. oh, darn. I'm going to have to get you back that name. It was a pharmaceutical company that I wasn't real familiar with. So um, I have the name and notes from that meeting, but I can't recall it right now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. And um, given that um, you just said, Brian, that uh, when you um, put forward your, your budget and started the work on it, that um, things were different and you've seen increased volumes and uh, such th since then. Um, given that what you've asked for in a change of charge is higher than what you have historically, and, um, you know, I don't want to infer too much based on um, the uh, tra new federal transparency uh, laws that were put in place, but when you, because you really can't even compare, it's, it's, uh, it, it needs so much work for 
hospitals to have true comparisons. But when you do take a look at it, and I think the Burlington Free Press article um, attempted to look at at least five uh, different categories, and North Country was high compared to their peers in most of that. So it, it appears that um, at least from uh, uh, a small look at, at what you're charging, you seem to be high compared to your peers. You have um, total cash on hand um, that's much higher than your peers, not only in Vermont, but throughout the Northeast, significantly higher. Um, you're coming off a, 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 a truly good financial year with total margin. Um, would you reconsider what you've requested since that uh, change in charge is, is higher than what you have uh, typically requested in the past? No, um, you know, we're talking about something that's happened over a few months. I and um, and like I said, there's all factors that come into um, how we manage that, you know, 2% to 3%. Right now it's 3%. Um, and we want to stay on that that path of a solid performance. And um, and so we do have we have, you know, Cerner costs. You know, a, a portion of those are one time, but we still have to look at what the market is, and um, and and the environment with the locums and and um, you know paying paying uh, adequate wages. Um, so I would just, if we had to redo this presentation, I would have flipped it and we would have taken out Cerner. We would still toward the told the Cerner, but we would have looked at what the projected for locums is, which is now you know right. we went again from nine to fifteen and we're projecting at twenty two. And what scares me to death is the rates we're hearing about what those hourly rates are for the locums. So we're not talking I don't even want to call it out, but there's you know in some cases the rates that we would have been paying have um, increased you know almost double. So that's what scares me. That's the big risk piece for next year. Yeah. So at this point, I'm going to turn the questioning over to the Healthcare Advocates Office and Kaylee and Sam. Morning, Chair Mullen. Uh, good morning, everyone. So this is Sam Peich. I'm a health policy analyst at the HCA. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Kylie and I are going to be asking questions at the hearings. Um, so just wanted to open up with thanking North Country for all that you've done and continue to do for Vermonters during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly given this recent services driven by the Delta variant. So in that vein, as you might be aware, the Department of Health and VT Digger just reported on this, releasing new data showing that BIPOC Vermonters are still disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 in the state. For example, Black Vermonters have a case rate that's almost three times higher than white Vermonters. So in this, in this realm, you probably saw that we submitted several pre-hearing questions that have a race equity focus. So those are gonna be the focus of our questions today. So our first question is, how much funding in your current and future budgets has been allocated to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, and or racial equity focused projects, trainings, or collaborations? Thank you for your question, Sam. So we, we unfortunately, we don't, um, we don't go that granular and carve out this specific um, expense. Uh, I can illustrate what we do. Um, you know, we do have, um, we try to use that as a, a component of how we operate. So uh, we have um, Leadership Development Institute classes and um, also Elsevier classes that we um, now are onboarding that every every um, employee will participate in as part of their annual um, um, in-service. Um, we have, um, we have uh, within our um, our um, our uh, medical group side, we have um, a position that is uh, our community wellness that seeks to influence and dialogue with community groups um, as diverse as they can be here in um, in Newport. We're not a diverse, you know, honestly, we're not a very diverse, um, and that's not going to change um, too quickly. Um, but um, we 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 seek to engage with uh, diverse groups through our community health needs assessment, which was just completed, um, and uh, um, and then we also um, I would say we try to um, recruit diversity. Um, most most recently over the last two years, 
we've recruited um, a number of nurses, international nurses, that uh, we have, I think, almost, we're, we're, we're approaching about 10 now, um, that are from countries like Kenya, um, the Philippines, and Jamaica. Um, and uh, those nurses have brought, um, in some cases, families, which are now in our school system. Um, we also, uh, they've also helped recruit um, others, um, friends and family, um, and we're continuing on that platform. So we're pleased with that. Um, and so I would say we're in a way, um, ironically, more, probably a little more diverse than we were a couple years ago because of that focus. Um, and uh, um, any any other thing I can answer in that regard, Sam? Thanks. No, I appreciate it. Um, kind of building off of that, do you have a sense of what percentage of staff and administrative leadership have received training in language access, implicit bias, cultural competency, or related trainings like that? Um, well, I would say within the year, it'd be 100% um, because of the, the courses um, that we brought on through Elsevier. Um, again, it's an online that you, it, you know, it's mandatory that you take it. Um, yeah. We also had, it wasn't this within this, well, it was within the last uh, 18 months, we had um, we had um, someone that was um, going through a gender change, change, and so we had some classes that we offered um, here um, to leaders and to staff um, to, um, to uh, support, um, in which the individual was a part of as well. So um, we seek to embrace opportunities that, uh, that come before us. Thank you. Yeah. You're muted, Kylie. Thank you. You mentioned in your narrative that um, all patients receive a patient um, satisfaction survey. And can you tell us what languages those patient satisfaction surveys are available in? The, my understanding is the uh, satisfaction survey is available on demand in Spanish. Um, and then for right now, that's what we have. And we do have a capability, I guess, to um, do a service to put it into more languages. Um, but again, like Brian um, noted before, we don't have that many people in our patient population that speak, you know, other languages. So we do have Spanish as the main one uh, with English. Okay. And do you, do you collect race or ethnicity data in your patient satisfaction surveys? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, we, we can find that out. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know if you can speak to this then. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you assess what uh, what the needs are in your community as far as language access or uh, diversity? How we assess it uh, or identify yeah. it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first of all, like coming into the hospital, we have to have we have a system. Um, all hospitals have this, but um, for when someone has some language needs, we have a certified interpreter system that we call. It's not just someone that's on staff that may speak the dialect um, unless they're certified, then we can use them. Um, so that would be point of care. Um, I think the other opportunity we'd have, again, is pointing back not to be overly redundant, but to more recently our community focus groups that we um, engage with um, in, re in re regards to our community health needs assessment. Um, I just, I haven't had much surface um, as far as opportunity on, on, um, on that lately that I can think of okay. top of my. Okay, thank you. And um, my final question is in regards to your um, financial assistance um, available to patients. I, I know you that you've that you mentioned in your written responses to us that you have interpretation services available. Are those available for people applying for financial assistance? Um, yes. Can they access interpretation services to ask questions and help get help filling out the surveys? When they that would be available when they're working with our navigators that help them with their financial assistance because the navigators have um, access to that tool. Um, so working with them, they would have access to that tool. Okay, thank you. And are the policies available in other languages? Are the, I mean, sorry, the applications available in other languages? I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's my last question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, next, we're going to turn to the public. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment on the North Country Hospital budget presentation? Does any member of the public wish to offer any comments on the uh, North Country presentation? I'm not seeing any hands, but I am seeing some blue around Dale. Dale, were you trying to offer a public comment? Go ahead. Yes, I lost connection for a minute and it came back. Um, I'm curious on uh, that last one where they said the only language that translation they offer is Spanish, um, but they get doctors and nurses from Canada. Wouldn't French be required as well? I mean, Quebec is mostly French. They are bilingual, but I'm just curious. It, it seems as though French would be required too. Yeah, Dale, that would be my first guess is the next language that we may that we would bring online if there was a need. Um, um, unless there again, we have interpretation services here at the hospital. Um, so um, if Canadians come and access care, um, it's it's likely through the emergency department. Uh, we don't have them establishing care through a primary care because the Canadian system won't. There was a day and age where they did pay for services here, but they they no longer do that. It's out of pocket. So we don't get as many um, um, Canadians that would come here that speak uh, mainly French. Or French Canadian, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Go ahead. Dale. Yeah. When you say that the locum, um, if I use the term correctly, is from other countries. I am curious, do you know how they get their education before they are hired by you? Um, I think there's an important conversation there that gets away from the hospitals, but nonetheless is important. So do you have any insight on that? Yeah, so Dale, good question. What we do is um, they have to meet acceptable um, um, board criteria to be able to work in the US. So um, so that doesn't it doesn't matter where the person of origin is um, or where they're coming from. It's a matter of if they they pass the proper boards, whether it be for nursing, um, for um, for a, a medical degree, uh, such as a doctor. So they have to meet, they have to pass those before they can even be licensed in Vermont to work. Ah, so, okay. And that has to be the Vermont exam or because I know like in Vermont, sometimes a test is only given every two years, things like that. So. Is it specifically Vermont exam? Uh, so uh, good question. So it depends on the 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 origin of the individuals or not the origin, but what what role that they're seeking to fill. So um, it's different for nursing. It's different for, again, a, a physician. There are national um, there are national um, boards that um, are associated with, say, um, general surgeons. Um, there's um, boards um, for nursing, uh, and then it gets a little more detailed um, or fine tuned, I guess, when it depends on the state. Um, I can't really speak more specifically of what Vermont may do the same or different than um, than a national board or a um, uh, a board coming from another state. There are programs, um, again, using as nursing as example, where um, uh, Vermont has um, now is now participating in a comp nurse compact. Um, and that allows nurses to cross borders. Uh, if they meet a certain, if they're licensed within a certain state, they can cross borders and work um, within um, within our hospital. Um, and it works the, the other way around too. Um, but internationally, if they're coming from an international across international borders, it's um, there's a little, there's more a layer of complexity there. 
Thank you for letting me ask some questions, and I listened to all of the board's questions. You did really well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Thanks. Is there other public comment? Any other public comment? Hearing none, um, Brian, Tracy, Megan, um, thank you for the presentation. And uh, we know these are uh, tough times as everybody's facing that uptick with the uh, COVID variant. And uh, please pass on our gratitude to uh, everyone uh, at your institution for their work, not only for the last year and a half, but for their work for Vermonters all the time. So thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to place um, this meeting in recess for um, 10 minutes for a bio break, and we will come back at um, 1035 and commence with the Rutland Regional Medical Center. Thank you.